Uh, how many of you are familiar with Spiffy? Cool. The ones that don't, just for a comparison of hands, like in the crowd. How many of you are security professionals? Okay. How many developers? Platform engineers? Cool. We should have something for everyone. Uh, Spiffy has been around for a little bit, like since 2017 was the first commit. This is not going to be your typical Spiffy session. Uh, it's not going to be a deep dive on implementation details. We are going to talk about many different dimensions, but it's primarily going to revolve around the value prop of the project. Why is it useful? Why should it matter for you? How can you apply it? Hopefully, we can also learn from you, like what you extrapolate, if you think of, of novel, novel ideas. We would love to answer as many questions as you have, but we're also here to have conversations. Fred? Cool. So with that, uh, one of the things that we want to try to cover are real world uh, spiffy scenarios and outcomes. And so we've had the opportunity over the past few years to be involved with, with several colleagues of ours in trying to work out a, a path towards like what works, what doesn't work, uh, and try to work out what those use cases are. So part of our hope is to be able to give you some of this information on some of our experiences that may help you uh, along the way. Yeah. And uh, with that, we're going we're gonna, to like, enumerate a number of observations that trace back for as long as we think people have tried to solve production identity issues and like, why is there so much technical debt? And, like, what's the job to, to catch up? So if you go check the RFC for the internet growth, uh, you're going to find many considerations, but one that's not present is security. I screenshot it, all that they covered, this is the one line. From there on, uh, we're, we're at a point in history where like, software not only runs on individual servers, they're very likely managed by a cloud provider. It's likely, uh, given European mandates, that you're not only doing multi-cloud, you're doing many multi-clouds, and that you're trying to address cross-authentication issues. It is a very interesting time also that there's like a high-speed network that interconnects our modern life, our modern economy, but at the same time, we're hyper-connected to adversaries and hackers. Yeah, and... And so in terms of trust, um, part of it is like, how do we actually develop to a point where we can start trusting uh, systems and people and processes? Like it's a really difficult thing to, to take into consideration. And part of the reason why is uh, that many of the assumptions that we've had today are, are very different from the assumptions that we had uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So one of the realities about um, most computer systems that are run by, by companies is that whatever, whenever they first develop their computer system is what they're native at. So if you develop your computer system when mainframes were the thing, then the only, the only native system that you have is probably going to be mainframe native. You're playing catch up with everything, with every, everything else from, from then on. So when we start looking at trust, we have those changes of assumptions over time. And those changes in assumption, like going from like, like uh, on-premise to like cloud as an example, like what has changed in those and trying to develop and maintain that trust is, is important to, to look at those assumptions and to you know, realize what, what has changed and what has not changed. Yeah. With that, another observation was, well, we know there's going to be vulnerabilities in, in software, but well, we'll just tackle them as, as they come. Like we'll hit them like a fly but it's more like trying to be a beekeeper of like a massive uh, honey production property. On average, uh, the National Vulnerability Database reports more than 15,000 new software vulnerabilities. So it is a given that you're gonna be struggling to just making sure it doesn't get compromised, which begs for, for novel approaches. With that is not, we can't trust the software, we can't trust the people either. Like, we all, like, while we have r capacity to reason, we all, our decisions are often, like, emotional also, right? People make mistakes, there's human error, people also get upset, and those individuals may have access to every single high-value asset within your organization. There are 10 of, 
of thousands of, success, of successful attacks and breaches that have a common denominator of either phishing or an exfiltrated credential. So that's another thing to keep an eye out for. But well, we're looking at the landscape. Sure, there's multiple platforms, multiple cloud boundaries. And it's just like we can't longer just put in walls because people may, within good intentions, like in order to conduct their jobs, we may be accessing resources across boundaries. And th these are legitimate. We should also like be able to determine uh, with certainty what, what is uh, from our people versus what could be a, a potential compromise. Yeah, so, so part of it is that as we start to move towards these new environments, there's a couple trends that we're starting to see. So some of the trends include we're expecting more, more, more development to occur in shorter time frames. Like people are saying, oh, there's a lot more newer technologies coming out, so we want to be able to ship faster, scale faster. And simultaneously, while this is happening, we're also looking at an increased level of communication between different, uh, different environments, different systems. So it's no longer one, the company and a few applications within it communicating, but we're looking at massive quantities of, of information and, and uh, work being done with other, with other groups. And so now what's happening is that the blast radius of a given, uh, of a given exploit is now, is now massive because once again, entry into an area, then at that point they can often jump from environment to environment until they get to the thing that they actually want to get to. And so what's, what this means is that the entire path of heading towards perimeter defense is starting to become untenable because of these changes that have occurred. So we have to start looking at how do we actually drive this towards something that's much more fine-grained, that uh, if there's, a, if there's a, a breach that occurs, that the uh, reward from that breach is, uh, is reduced because the architecture of the systems, the applications themselves, have been designed specifically to limit and not, not trust fully the systems that they connect to, but instead are looking at, okay, well, what am I talking to? What am I allowed to communicate to yeah. them? And, and to also work, not only to have this fine grain, but also to do so in a very dynamic environment, because it's no longer an environment where you sit down and you program access control list, and then they last there for several years. We're getting to the point now where we have to be able to make on-demand decisions for every request and in order to, in, in order to handle the, the changes that we're, that we're seeing within the yeah. industry. And, and the ones uh, in the audience that are engineers, application developers, you know there's a trend of you're not only being asked with the business logic, you're also being asked with the availability, the performance, and there's a current trend around DevSecOps where we're also expecting to shift security left. So all of these little people trying to wrangle things, like you could be all of these folks or this could be the different people in your organization, but we are not keeping up, we're barely tre treading water. So to get a little bit more into the substance, we talked about like, well, we can't have perimeters, like the, the perimeter evaporated with the cloud. Uh, access control, secrets management, and identity are tightly intertwined. But this perimeter is, is pretty soft, like managing secrets at scale requires proper authentication, proper authorization, you need to prove uh, by, by a possession or recognition technology who you are. So how and does massively large infrastructure, can we tell with certainty something we've never seen before, if it's rogue or if it's legit? And how do we transition to evaluate and say, well, this is something I've never seen before, therefore should have no access, to this is something that I know very well, and therefore here are its, here are its keys. But when we uh, issue these keys, uh, or we use secrets management, and we map policies to say, this workload will have access to the secret, we start encountering a problem of infinite regression, which is for every secret, like Vault is great, uh, other like, secret stores are, are awesome, until you have to prove to them who you are. Because then you need another secret. It's a problem of secure introduction. How do we do that? And for that secret, well, let's protect it, let's encrypt it, but now we need a decryption key. And this repeats over and over until ultimately we have a paper key that we're very likely putting into a fiscal bank to protect it. And that's the root keys of, of our organization. Yeah. 
Also, don't forget as well that uh, the moment you have to rotate some of these keys because one of them is compromised, then you may not even know where all the keys are that you have to go off and, and rotate. And so you're left with, left with this option of do you rotate the key and cause possible downtime uh, if you don't have that good, uh, that good tracking, or do you end up rotating um, and uh, bring, possibly bring down certain certain system as a result of that if if your tracking is is not uh, is is not done well like it's it's not an easy problem. So enters a Spiffy, uh, and Spiffy starts with a man many of you have might come across this week or know his accomplishments and what he has done to like modernize infrastructure and development platforms. Joe Bita, one of the co-creators of Kubernetes at Google, having left Google and figuring out what he wanted to work next, he evaluated what other systems existed at Google that could follow the same pattern as Kubernetes of let's externalize it, make it a, an abstraction for everyone else, and uh, open source it. And he stumbled upon uh, a system at Google called the Low Overhead Authentication System. A uh, deep dive of that is outside of this scope, but Joe presented a great talk, uh, who's calling? If a service comes up, how do I know what it is? If like, we're looking at things with IP addresses or certificates, but the certificates have been reused, reshared. This kicked off a movement and convened uh, people from large organizations that have solved the problem for themselves, but understood the value prop of doing it in the community, doing it openly, and uh, gathering at the Netflix office, individuals from Netflix, Facebook, and Google uh, proposed what were the key attributes and virtues if we we're gonna build a universal PKI that is fully automated, high velocity, how should that look like? From there on, uh, the community gathered, and like the first commit it was in December 2017. Uh, the project was accepted at a sandbox level in the CNCF in April 2018. Since then, it's had great traction and adoption. It is the highest trending, rapidly growing uh, CERT distribution protocol for cloud native projects. We see it. In Estio, we see it in Envoy. If you go to the Spiffy repo and the Spire repo and check the ad adopters markdown file, that list grows regularly. Uh, we've also seen it deployed by very large organizations that we've come to rely on. We rely on GitHub for our jobs. Uh, some individuals may like TikTok from ByteDance. Uh, if you use Square Payments or if you hail a car with Uber, all of their services, all their interactions between uh, the microservices that make up their applications are spiffy protected. And this environment scale from a few dozen hosts to a thousands, millions of hosts at a global scale. Yeah, so part of, so part of it is when we start looking at where company, from a company perspective, uh, like we, we have we have some good examples of uh, of other of other problems that that mirror ours. So, for example, uh, historically, if you look at application develop uh, applications and users, they were very much uh, centric to the application. Every application maintained their own database. Uh, we're sort of in this position today with uh, with Kubernetes, where every Kubernetes cluster keeps track of its own workloads and it's very isolated to the to those particular environments. Uh, over time, we worked out, okay, well, we can, we can extract that out into its own identity provider for those users. And at that point, you can get single sign-on across systems. So if you think about like Spiffy, provides a, a set of standards that allows you to get the, the equivalent single sign-on uh, mutual TLS authentication across the board. Um, and then we could take it a step further because these are very well-defined standards and start looking at, well, how do we federate across? Like, well, we have two CAs and we can get those CAs to federate with each other. At that point, that gives us to, a, to an area where if, if, I, if 
I, if my organization, uh, if you trust my organization to test my uh, workloads properly and, and I trust your organization to attest your wor workloads properly, then we can federate those top level CAs and that gets us a global, uh, that gets us a, a global scalable environment where we can reason about the, the identities in a, in a secure way. I'm sure most of you will understand this very well, but leaving KubeCon, what I've seen the majority of people who understand the technology well is how do they convince the rest of the business. So we're not going to play slide deck karaoke for this, but the slides will be made available. Mm -hmm. why, would, why would it matter to an executive? How you do that top-down sale? Why would it matter to the cloud provider you consume from and the different services? If they put this on their service mesh, they get mutual transport layer security for free in one fell swoop. Amazon Web Services App Mesh implements Aspire to accomplish that and there are many others that have also followed suit. Uh, we've included a few more. Uh, why would it matter to the InfoSec team or to security engineering? Why would it matter to uh, DevOps practitioners? There are a number of these that we're going to rehash uh, further down. While we're here and given like the objectives around regulations, compliance that exist in Europe, there are uh, couple compelling benefits that will appeal to you. The implementation, the reference implementation of the Spiffy APIs, which is Aspire, uh, makes sure that ensures that identities are non reputable. I think I'm setting, saying the, the word right. How would you say it, Tiffany? <laughs> repudiated. Non repudiated. Thank you. Uh, so there's there's like native encryption, you get uh, all traffic in motion will be encrypted, which is a problem at an application layer. Going back to the Google story of why Google did this when the NSA leaks happened and uh, organization claimed that they were able to intercept their dark fiber, their fiber optics between their data centers and snoop their traffic, uh, Google executives issued a company-wide mandate that all traffic had to be encrypted at an application layer because the network was hostile. They couldn't trust it. So uh, there's that compliance and auditability. Uh, if you want to talk to the GDPR angle, Fred. Yeah, so in, when you look at, um, at GDPR and location, so part of it is uh, you have to be able to tell where, where things are. You have to be able to tell who, who you're communicating with. And so if, so that, this gives the ability to to provide that uh, to provide those identities in such a way that you can help reason about some of some of these based upon like you have other factors it's not just about the certificate so you have to have constant re-verification that 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 identity is where it is so for example one of the one of the key features that we see in many spiffy implementations is that the keys are kept uh, the lifetime of the certificates are kept very short so uh, the, the default out of the box is usually one hour, so the keys get rotated every half hour or so. So what this means is you have to constantly revalidate the environment, and those revalidations could include things like, am I in the correct geo ge geographic location? Am I, do I have any CVEs that are, bit, that are at a certain level that I need to go and report on? So having that constant revalidation helps a lot with compliance because it's no longer, okay, a point in time, am I compliant? And then that system may stay up for months or years on end. It becomes, a, it, it provides an opportunity to have constant revalidation of the environment that it lives in and the context that it's in. Uh, and it and drives you towards uh, towards that ability to to make decisions on the fly as to whether you want to continue accepting yeah. the risk. And just just to add to that, there's there's a lot of flexibility and customization for how you design trust boundaries and trust domains, and having the ability to have multiple routes of trust and ensuring, as we see in the picture, that data in America may travel to clusters and deployments in Europe, but ensuring that data in Europe stays local, stays sovereign, stays untamperable. There are savings, right? You have witnessed this yourself. Yeah, and so generally when you look at, uh, at what executives uh, look at from a financial perspective, they, there's usually two aspects. You have CapEx and OpEx. 
So usually what ends up happening is we see, okay, there's an increase in CapEx because you have to go off and, and build the infrastructure or make that shift in infrastructure. Um, but over time, as you start to get to a more automated environment, it provides an opportunity for, for OpEx. And uh, part of this is through the enablement of, of automation. So one uh, pattern that I've seen is uh, when we look at what the current, I current identity of most systems is, it's not a cryptographic identity, it's actually the IP address and port combination. So that means every decision has to be made upon what IP address and ports are allowed to communicate with each other. And so when it comes time to make a change, like, hey, we're gonna sunset an application, you have to look at all of those from an access control list on your firewalls, and worst case scenario, the developers for the first application ask for permission and then did not for the subsequent things that go through. Uh, so, so what this yeah. allows us to get to is to to get to a place where we're able to analyze the cryptographic identities using things like uh, Envoy, uh, OPA, Kiverno, and similar that have integrated in Spiffy support. They're able to make those decisions. And so, when you make a decision that hey, this this uh, application is being sunset and it's actually been shut down. Uh, or needs to be mitigated because, or needs to be uh, isolated because of, a, because of a compromise, then that automation uh, ends up uh, paying off through the OPEX side of things. So there's, uh, there's significant advancements that, uh, from the automation perspective yeah. that, that you can get out and, of this. And along with automation, the, the big promise of automation has been developer productivity and efficiencies. But going back to learning curves, if you have to be an expert in the native controls of Google Cloud, and then you also need to learn AWS IAM, it's really hard to cross-deploy, and you need to hire individuals that are certified in those different areas. But if you're able to reason holistically about a single identity control plane that abstracts all those underlying implementation details, you gain those efficiencies. We included a chart here where uh, we see other gains. I'm not going to cover them for all, uh, all of them. I'm not going to enumerate it. But if you want to take a picture, I see phones out. You can also check the sli slides online. Also, not having if identity and transport layer security and cross-cloud authentication is being provided by a function of the underlying infra infrastructure, and it's not something you need to think about. You don't need to think about uh, revoking and re a certificate revocation lists, or you don't need to think about, as Fred was alluding earlier, uh, how do you go rotate, force rotate, because it's happening automatically, and identities can be aggressively short-lived, and you get that by having the underlying infrastructure just the same way that Kubernetes does the orchestration for you, and you don't need to think, oh, I want, I want like to monitor, or I have to keep an eye, every time a node dies and I need to reschedule the container just the same way that's liberated us from doing that infrastructure management through automated APIs. That's what Spiffy does, does for identity. And there's also a very specific, re one of the reasons we've been able to keep some of the costs down in this path as well is this is not a new form of let's go build a new encryption scheme. Let's go build a new, uh, a new format. What it is is it's leveraging uh, standard, so it's using the X509, so the same thing that you see browsers use. It integrates well with Mutual TLS, and Mutual TLS was designed specifically for X509 certificates. So it's not like we're bringing in some esoteric set of protocols and say, use this thing in, in replacement of, of things like TLS. Instead, so we're saying, go use Mutual TLS, go, go use the standards. What, it, what Spiffy is providing you is two primary things. The first one is a very well-defined document so that you can reason about other identities that uh, may not be part of your immediate infrastructure. Uh, the second thing it's providing is a set of APIs that, that define how to automate the rotation of those certificates and how to, how to automate the uh, delivery of, of that information. So by focusing primarily on those two things and saying we're gonna focus in, on maintaining standards, it provides, it provides a, uh, an, it, we, it ends up uh, allowing you to, to use your, your current existing in, uh, mutual TLS implementations. Uh, that includes in evolving area. standards too. Exactly. Uh, recently we have been approached by uh, the crypto agility community, folks that are working on post-quantum cryptography because they see Spiffy as the platform that can help them get there uh, over like a, a near horizon. Uh, there are more savings. Uh, 
again, this, this came out from organizations that have done this at extremely large scale globally, deciding to contribute it to the rest of the world. And they spend years, they spend a lot of engineering resources uh, to build this, to put the different integrations and plugins, but it's readily available for you to consume. So you're saving on that development time and the cost of going on, on that journey, on that path on, on your own. Uh, there's all these concerns of like, you would have to think about if you do it on your own. Uh, there are very important questions to answer, like who is making the certificates? How are they distributed securely? Where, where are they stored? What happens if, if something expires and gets jammed up? Uh, as I said before, all these concerns need to, need to be answered. Uh, there are many people who have dedicated identity management teams. And being able to liberate them to like, focus on, on other concerns is what we hear from, from the community that uh, rewards them the most. Yeah, one of the one of the main things that's come uh, recently was this, the at least in the uh, reference implementation Spire was the ability to support uh, cloud-based KMS systems, and so uh, part of the reason you would want to bring in the KMS is that if the application is or infrastructure is compromised, the KMS allows you to shut off access to the signing keys and allows you to control uh, and log when those keys are are issued out. So. Uh, if, you t if you talk with any major organization that has something sensitive to protect, uh, almost all of them without exception are using some form of KMS or an equivalent. And so, we, so Spire uh, now has that, that capability to tie into those KMS systems. And so you're not storing the sign-in key directly in Spire, but instead it's integrating with, uh, with a richer ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. So. Last, last set of outcomes before we start moving into as scenarios. It's like, sure, this is awesome. How do I explain this to my security team? Why would they care? A big mandate organizations are moving towards is implementing a zero trust architecture. But there's no path to zero trust unless when you're breaking ground for the construction, you, you do a strong foundation of identity. This has to be a steel thread to support granular, identifiable, know who the subjects are in your distributed system. You cannot do zero trust if you have a, a black box. So once you know the subjects, the objects that they access, what are the different relationships, what are the communication pathways, you can make zero trust policy assertions. If they are a very defense-driven uh, security team, you can uh, converse with them about uh, the OWASP top 10, the top 10 most prevalent cybersecurity attacks for web applications. The majority, seven out of 10, all re revolve around broken access control, poor forms of identity, intermediary solutions. So lots of appeal here. And the APIs give them a programmatic mean to enforce policies, to interrogate the system, to determine if things are implemented according to the, their security policies. So very compelling to, to security individuals. And I see some faces like, cool, so what next? Like, how does Spiffy Inspire actually work? So we talked about when something comes up we've never seen before, how do we go to issuing a, an identity? So if a container comes up, gets scheduled by Kubernetes, the first thing that it's going to ask the Spire uh, agent, which implements the Spiffy Workload API, is who am I? And the agent will initiate a set of parallel introspections. It's going to ask the Linux kernel for its metadata, what SGID, what PID, et cetera. It's going to come back to Kubelet and say, hey, Kubelet, who scheduled this? Was it, was it the controller, in fact? What metadata do you have? What namespace? What service account token? If it's running and let's pick Amazon Web Services, it's going to interrogate the AWS Instance Metadata API and say, hey, what availability zone is the underlying machine in? What security group? And if everything matches the way it's intended to look, the way you've defined it up front, registering workloads. Every time, regardless the environment, it will, it will do this checks. If it matches, it will do 
the, the process of minting an identity through, there's a certificate sign request, there's distributing it back, giving it the other key material to cross-authenticate to other workloads. So what is like, okay, but it's a little confusing, like where's the split between Spiffy and Spire? I just want to remind you that Spiffy is the specification. It's the API documents of how do these APIs conform by a compliant uh, Spiffy implementation. Spire is actually running this in software. There's a few Spire components. There's a server. There's, there's an agent. There's exposing the workload API. There's a federation API to talk about, to talk across multiple deployments, to talk to cloud providers. And you see a little like half, half life cycle of what uh, that looks from spec, but this is also what uh, Spire implements. Here's a recap of the different components, their identities, their identity documents, workload API. There's a trust bundle, the, the, what I just mentioned. So how does it look in practice? How does it look when actually implemented running across a, a number of nodes? So one thing to be aware of is that Spiffy and Spire themselves are, they're not a service mesh. So all it does is it provides authentication of workloads and provides a path to, to maintain that and, and to, and to uh, validate and, and, uh, make, and learn something about what that workload is. So a, a large part of what's, of what's necessary to make it useful is that you have to have integration with other, with, with other components. And so, uh, we, so that it integrates with things like Envoy, where Envoy is able to consume that spiffy identity, it's able to make use of it, able to validate through mutual TLS. Uh, the remote system that it's connecting to. There's, uh, there's integration with, uh, with Istio, where Istio is using Spiffy identities in order to d do, uh, determine what the workloads are. Uh, there's recent work that was done as well that should be in the latest uh, Istio version that also allows it to connect into the, re to the uh, Spire server that we described before, which helps get us to the point where we're, I was mentioning that the, that identity is, the, the Kubernetes cluster itself is an identity provider or the application on top of its identity provider helps us move away from that so we get to that place where we can have an external identifiable, uh, uh, defendable um, identity provider. And we then are able to hook in the clusters into those, into those environments. So, uh, there, so, the, so the key here is that is, is it provides a, a standard way to reason about I, about workload identities, a standard way to communicate with those uh, with those systems, and to retrieve identity or prove or prove about it, and then makes it easy for other applications to be able to make use of those primitives in order to uh, in order to solve a problem in the larger context that is based upon what use case is, is trying to be solved. And this is not exclusive for production systems at runtime. There's active work for applying the virtues of Spiffy and Spire to the supply chain, ranging from protecting your signing and verification tooling, protecting and total machinery. If you've seen Project Six Store and CoSign, they implement Spiffy identity documents. Uh, there's several areas. A uh, great person to talk to, Marina Moore uh, in the back, maintainer of Intoto, uh, recently published the secure supply chain reference architecture, and it. It's predicated on strong cryptographic identity to ensure the integrity from commit, uh, from source all the way to build and shipping an artifact. And going back to the attestation, being able to determine, has this binary been signed? Does it have a binary signature that I expect to see or not? If it's not something that I have the certainty that my builders did it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be uh, deployed to be here, and this gets us really to like a solar winds proof uh, implementation of Spire integrating with the projects over on the supply chain domain. Yeah, a really good example of that as well is that when you look at Spiffy, Spiffy is designed specifically for that ephemeral identity. Are you a member of my system right now? Or are you a member of a system that I trust uh, right now? So it is not designed for, let's go validate the certificate a, a year from now because those certificates will get rotated over time. And so 
uh, so part of it is like when you start looking at supply chain provenance is like, well, how do we take something that is now used that to bootstrap the signing process so that something can then sign it at that particular time for, for the long term and still have enough information there that you're able to still reason, a, reason about it. So there's a, there's a really nice uh, uh, collaboration between these short term uh, spiffy identities and hitting the long term uh, needs of like I signed something I need to be to be able to validate a year or two years down the line that this thing yeah. was signed by by that entity. So I have slides that I can quickly flip over. We have five minutes left. Uh, I was told that we, we could hold space, but I want to see what questions do we have before we proceed further. Yes. And hang on, wait for the mic because we are recording this session, and so. Perfect. Um, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Hello. Um, so let's say I'm running Kubernetes and Istio. You mentioned before that like Istio uses like Spiffy and stuff, and uh, around like Kubernetes is essentially like workload provider. Am I essentially using Spiffy and like workload identity if I am using Istio or I guess Linkerd? Um, assuming Linkerd uses the same. Yeah, I know you, you want to take at it. Yeah, because the, the 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 thing with it is that. Um, when um, when Istio first made use uh, of of Spiffy, so they they used it to pr to produce the workload identity. So you are using Spiffy when you're using Istio. One of the challenges we've uh, we've had that we've been uh, working towards is well, how do we handle the federation story? Because the from the federation aspect of it, uh, that if if you don't have that ability to federate across environments and then you're you're limiting your identity to that specific uh, cluster yeah. there are a couple things you can do so you could say well we're going to put a ca at the top that will then sign an intermediate uh, and then istio will then issue it out so that can help with federation okay uh, but part of uh, part of something that uh, that we've had discussions on is like how do we get the federation apis themselves to become part of a standard which means that when you want to communicate across boundaries, then mm -hmm. the the first thing you're doing is you're turning towards a standardized way to to approach that, and then it means that you're not relying purely on something that's uh, spiffy or sorry, not spiffy uh, like Istio specific to mm -hmm. to establish like through transit gateways or similar and transferring all that information to and from the, the systems, yep. but uh, but would help provide a way that you could reason even across boundaries where the thing that you're communicating with might not even be in the same company as you. So. There's uh, there's some work that needs to be done towards uh, towards yeah. that. There's um, one more aspect. I don't want, I don't want to talk over, but I, something to underline is attestation. Without attestation, you may have something that looks like in the Spiffy ID, but you don't have the the same security guarantees. Yeah. Uh, there is recent upstream work uh, led by Max Lambrecht from HPE where he implemented the interfaces to very elegantly swap Citadel, which is uh, Istio's native uh, identity system, mm -hmm. for Spire. In the past, uh, it was quite cumbersome and uh, across releases it would break, uh, but we, we've gotten that. I had also uh, opened an issue that the team over by Tetrate, they have a booth in the expo floor, uh, implemented federation in both Envoy and Istio to achieve cross-cluster MTLS and authenticate on-mesh to off-mesh. Cool. So if you do just the spiffy within Istio, the legacy implementation, all you can do is within cluster, uh, with a lot of heavy lifting, cross Istio cluster. Yeah. But if you do uh, Spire, you can have non-sidecar, uh, non-service mesh, mm -hmm. traditional workloads running on bare metal, uh, that are spiffy identified cross authenticate mm -hmm. and really blur blurs that service mesh. Awesome. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. And oh, it also, um, I, there's some workloads that I'm thinking about back at back at the office that um, are going to benefit from because they're not in the service mesh at the moment uh, with that sort of stuff. So super appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. the, the attestation that you mentioned as well could actually tie down to like a TPM. So if you want to say these particular things, the hardware literally came from us and we can prove it. Uh, like those attestations are, are very powerful in, in meeting that as well. What other questions we do you have? We have another question here in the back and then you were next after. Does someone raise your hand back there too? We'll go here first. Okay, here you go. 
So let's talk turtles. How yeah. did you solve the problem to secure the agent that it is that uh, tells the uh, containers what their identity is? Yeah. So if there is a um, yeah attacking. Uh, um, agent, how can I be sure that he? Uh, that, that great, he great question. So, attestation occurs at uh, two levels. We didn't cover node attestation, uh, but it is the process of verifying the authenticity and integrity of the underlying machine, whether that is bare metal using an X509 pop from your root of trust, or that's uh, a cloud virtual machine. There are a number. I will happily share with you the threat model. Uh, we've done both the Cure 53 security audit where they scrutinized the project. Also, the team over in NYU Tandem Labs had uh, ensured uh, the security boundaries of, well, what if we have a rogue agent? Can, can that agent compromise the server? Can that agent compromise the workload? Uh, happy to have that discussion if you want a sidebar, but it is a little bit elaborated and I rather illustrate it on slides that I don't have on, on this deck. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, Brandon Lum. You is, hang on, I'm just going to the mic. It's okay if we run a little bit lo longer? Okay, just let us know. I just want to add to that. I think there are some ongoing efforts as well to kind of tie this to hardware root of trust. So you have measurements that get extended into the TPM you have things like the kernel integrity measurement architecture that actually um, track with a very, very small um, trusted computing base um, what is being executed and making sure that they get the, the right identities for uh, what, uh, what a container is running. Thank you, Brandon. That's, that's a spot on. There's efforts that are far along. There's an existing TPM attestation that was contributed upstream by Bloomberg Financial. Uh, there's also a team of researchers in a university in Brazil that are doing work around uh, SGX and secure enclaves, and it's pretty far, far along, and they've just galvanized the community. Uh, there's efforts combined with the Confidential Computing Group yeah. and, and Linux Foundation. So, yeah. yeah, happy to also share that with you and provide pointers. Yeah, the, the key to it, though, is that we don't want to trust only the agent to say, oh, yeah, this thing met the requirements and allow it to craft whatever message it wants. Like, the best case scenario is that you have cryptographic, cryptographically verifiable material that can be presented, which could be the TPM, could be a AWS uh, identity document, could be a GCP workload, uh, uh, or maybe uh, information from like assigned bill of materials or, or similar that you can then send into that to help with some of that provenance. And so you, you definitely don't want to have just like, hey, trust me, I'm the agent and I, and I validate it, we're good to go. So. Hey, um, as far as I understand with the workload API, or at least with Spire, when a workload kind of registers, it gets given a set of identities. What was the, re like the reason for doing that? Because it seems strange to me when you kind of register as an identity, you, you, are, you have an identity, right? Why do you get given a choice um, for that? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to try to repeat your question as, as I understand it. Uh, you're, you're saying, well, you already registered an identity. Why are you sending this yet uh, like an incarnation of that identity? plus some other identity, some other key material. Is that an, an accurate understanding? Yeah, so like it will give me like different options to choose yeah. from as my spiffy ID. Let's say. For sure. Yeah. So you, you define a spiffy ID that may be uh, spiffy colon slash slash kubecon uh, mall level slash uh, spiffy session. Uh, this is something that has yet to be born or incarnate, but we are going to deploy it at one point we may have multiple instances if we scale up a Kubernetes service and there's 100 pods for this. So you're defining conceptually uh, the kid that's about to be born. This is the name that we're going to give it. If the DNA test checks out, the paternity test checks out, and it's the mom and the dad, and it has the height, the weight, all these aspects, then you issue the uh, birth certificate, if you may and then ensure that that is protected. And that kid, in order to go to uh, throughout life, that uh, birth certificate con converts into a passport or a driver's license. 
and that needs to federate and go through like checks of different countries. I, I'm going a little bit far off with the analogy, but hopefully that that illustrates it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. I'm just um, maybe we can talk about it later, but like yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. We we didn't dive. There's there's a very there's a very uh, what would be the, the right word? I, I want to be very precise with my language. There's a very deterministic process of order of operations that are followed uh, to issue that. Uh, I'm happy if, if you want to spend five minutes to, to walk through, th through that. That was some analogy. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. <laughs> um, I want to make sure for the recording, you get to tell everybody where they can find you, how they can contribute. Yes. Go through the slide, right? please. Sure. So our website is spiffy.io. We actually have a book on there as well. So if you like the material that was here, uh, we it's not uh, super specific to like Spire itself. It tries to set the stage as to like why Spiffy exists and to try to provide some information. Uh, Gentleman in the in the back, I believe he's gonna like the title. What's the na the title of the book, uh, Fred? Oh, what did we name it? it was something about yeah. turtles all something the way about, down. Yeah. I have a signed copy. <laughs> Solving of this the bottom book. turtle. Solving the bottom turtle. That was it. Yeah. Um, and um, so we also have multiple places you can come collaborate with us. So uh, we have a mailing list. We have uh, we have a Slack that you can come join. And of course, you're always welcome to grab yeah. the uh, the source code and collaborate on on GitHub. And, and come participate. We we are a growing community. Uh, contributing it starts as simply as showing up. Uh, my own personal journey and an open source. I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I didn't feel I was like at the level of the experts or the idea that I had. If I thought of it, someone must have already thought of it. They're working on it. Uh, please uh, come hang out, be vocal, uh, tell us what's on your mind, tell us what are the problems that matter to you. Uh, we can really build t this together. Uh, Jeff, uh, Fred and I have been involved in, in different capacities. But we have Marcus Yedro, who's been a longtime uh, maintainer and contributor to the project. Uh, we have different folks in the room, and we've all come from different angles, different perspectives. Yeah, there's there's also uh, a uh, ecosystem that's trying to develop around some of this as well. So it's not just about like Spiffy and, and Spire, but also the tooling that it, that's developing around it. There's a number of opportunities that for collaboration. So one example is that. We, we very specifically do not put claims inside of the, the Spiffy uh, document other than some very basic uh, predefined claims. So there were some, uh, there were some very uh, good reasons around like trying to avoid pre-authorization uh, pre being stuck inside of the claims that uh, we didn't want. Or the X509 itself is also very rigid. It's like all or nothing if you put the claims in. You can't like select certain claims and put them out. But there's, uh, there's opportunities around, okay, well, how do we deal with claims? How do we deal with, uh, with the uh, federation or transitive identity? So these are real Super problems. interesting. Unresolved problems at an industry, industry level. Yeah. We also need help with our documentation. Yeah. We also need help with tutorials. Uh, we also need help with like novel ways to tell compelling narrative. So yeah, any and all contributions. Uh, thank you for your time and letting us hold the space. And can we talk you into maybe going down to the, the expo for the next two hours? That's right. And as interesting as this conversation was, imagine how much more interesting over beer. <laughs> so you can find these two lads downstairs, hopefully. I mean, don't just pin them to this room and not let them get down there, because I know there's more questions that haven't been answered yet. But I really want to thank them. These are two of my favorite members of the community. Frederick and I go so far back. I chose this talk because it's an interesting talk. I love that book, The Bottom Turtle. I stalked him at KubeCon LA until he signed a copy for me. Really good stuff, so look up, look up the book as well. Um, and can we give him a, a big round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Good job.